stop. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you so much for coming out on such a, a, a stormy night. I hope, it, I hope it wasn't too difficult getting here. Um, uh, my name is Sister Kathleen Duffy. I am professor of physics here at Chestnut Hill College and also the director of the Institute for Religion and Science. Tonight we are joined by several members of the Institute's advisory committee. Um, they might want to raise their hands. Ed, Ed Davini, uh, Frank Hoffman, they're, they're taking the back seats. Pat, Patrick McCauley, uh, Nelson Rivera, and Leonard. Uh, um, in, in the name of the Chestnut Hill College community and in the name of the Institute's advisory committee, I would like to welcome you to the Sugarloaf campus of Chestnut Hill College and to the second lecture in the Institute's spring 2013 lecture series. As many of you know, the Institute is dedicated to nurturing the constructive engagement of religion, spirituality, with science, technology and endeavors to promote a dialogue that is interfaith, multi-science, and civil, with the accent on the civil. Thanks to the generous support of Chestnut Hill College and the Metanexus Institute, thanks to the endless hours and great ideas of our expert advisory committee and our technical in assistant, Andrea Wenzel, we continue to provide quality programming, at least we think so. And I think we'll show tonight that that's really true. In case you're not on our mailing list yet, don't forget to sign up at the table in the back, at the back of the hall. That way we can keep you informed about our lectures since we, uh, since we hope that after this evening you will want to return. You can find information about our events on our website. That's www.irands. So, uh, Institute, Religion, and Science.org. So, irans.org. <laughs> but there are little cards at the back if you can't remember that, which I would never be able to do. Um, you can pick a, a card and that, that would, you know, you'll be able to get it from there. And there's a flyer in the back announcing the, the last lecture in our series this uh, semester. Jesuit John Staudenmeyer from the University of Detroit uh, Mercy will speak on the rediscovery of place in technology and prayer. He'll be here at Chestnut Hill College on Monday, April 8th, and at St. Joseph University on April 9th, the Tuesday. Both of these events are at 7 o'clock. You can visit us on Facebook and read our Science and Religion blog. We're just beginning that if you want to to add anything, we would be glad for new, in, in new uh, uh, entries. And our reading circle will begin discussing Teilhard de Chardin's The Divine Milieu on April 15th. We, um, we usually meet once a month, so and on a Monday night, usually the second Monday, but as someone uh, reminded me, the 15th is not the second Monday. But if you'd like to join us, just let me know. I would be glad to have uh, new members. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our guest for this evening. Dr. Andrew Newberg is Director of Research at the Myron Brind uh, Center for Integrative Medicine at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and Medical College, as well as Adjunct Professor of Religious Studies and Associate Professor of Radiology at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. Dr. Newberg graduated from Haverford College in 1988 with a degree in chemistry, received his medical degree in 1993 from the University of Pennsylvania, completed postgraduate training in internal medicine with a residency at the Graduate Hospital, and then did a fellowship in nuclear medicine at the University of Pennsylvania Department of Radiology. He's certified in both internal medicine and nuclear medicine. Dr. Newberg is a prominent researcher in the field of nuclear medical brain imaging. He has developed neurotransmitter tracers and pursued neuroimaging research projects for the evaluation of religiosity, 
as well as neurological and psych psychiatric disorders, including clinical depression, aging, and dementia, head injury, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. He has also researched the neurophysiological correlates of acupuncture, meditation, and alternative therapies, and how brain function is associated with mystical and religious experiences. Newberg is considered a pioneer in the field of neurotheology, the scientific study of religious and spiritual experiences, a field that attempts to better understand the nature of religious and spiritual practices and experiences and their implications for the study of mind, brain, consciousness, morality, theology, and philosophy. His research has included brain scans of people in prayer, meditation, rituals, and various trance states, surveys of people's spiritual experiences and attitudes, and the evaluation of the relationship between religious and spiritual phenomena and health. This includes a recent study on the effect of meditation on memory. Dr. Newberg also helped develop stress management programs for the University of Pennsylvania Health Systems and has taught interdisciplinary courses such as the biology of spirituality and science and the sacred at an introduction to neurotheology. He has published over 150 research articles, essays, and book chapters, and is co-author of the best-selling books, Why God Won't Go Away, Brain Science and the Biology of Belief, and How God Changes Your Brain, Breakthrough Findings from a Leading Neuroscientist. This evening, Andy will present material from his latest book, Principles of Neurotheology. Andy has also presented his research in national and international public forums. He's appeared on Nightline, 2020, Good Morning America, ABC's World News Tonight, National Public Radio, London Talk Radio, and over 15 nationally syndicated radio programs, as well as in films, What the Bleep Do We Know, and Religious. His work has been featured in Time, Newsweek, uh, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and New Scientist, as well as many other newspapers and magazines. So it is a real pleasure for me to uh, present to you Dr. Andy Newberg, who will give us more information about this fascinating new discipline of neurotheology. Please join me in welcoming Andy to Chestnut Hill College and to our institute gathering. Uh, well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And, um, and again, thank you for coming out. I guess it seems strange to call this the spring series, but uh, it doesn't feel much like spring out there today. Uh, so uh, I wanted to take the opportunity tonight to speak to you about uh, a field of research, I guess, or scholarship. I, I like to use the word scholarship a little bit more than research, although it also incorporates research, uh, called neurotheology. And um, uh, as Kathy mentioned, I recently published a book called Principles of Neurotheology. And I suppose uh, part of what prompted me to do this was that um, over the last five years or so, uh, a lot of people kind of keep coming up to me to talk about neurotheology. They keep uh, telling me that I invented the term, which is not true, actually. Uh, but, um, but it just kind of came to pass that they kept thinking that I was somehow very deeply related to this term, neurotheology, even though obviously it has uh, a lot of interesting uh, implications for it and maybe some baggage as well. But I realized that uh, I guess if they're going to keep saying that I have something to do with it, I may as well actually kind of take the bull by the horns and, and actually say something about it so that I can feel uh, more comfortable talking about it in the future. So that was, is what led to uh, this idea of putting together a book that really started to think about, well, what if, if neurotheology is going to be something, uh, something that we're going to do something about, uh, what, what should we do with it? How, do we, how should we proceed in doing neurotheology, whatever that means? Uh, in fact, I get called a neurotheologian, which I'm not even sure what that means either. So, um, so um, uh, actually, uh, the one the one other kind of little funny story was that um, my, my late colleague Jean DeQuilly was a deep lover of Latin. So I originally wanted to title the book Principia Neurotheologica, but 
Um, unfortunately or fortunately, I don't know, the, uh, the, uh, the editors decided that they did not want to do that. So uh, I did work it into the first chapter, though. So I, I felt at least somewhat vindicated with that. So what is neurotheology? Well, I'm going to define it a little bit more specifically later. But, but to start with, um, neurotheology, I think, is a really unique field of scholarship that seeks to understand the relationship specifically between the brain and theology and more broadly between the mind and religion. And I'm going to you know, talk about all of these different aspects a little bit later, but that's at least our starting point for the night. So uh, as you heard uh, to some degree in my introduction, there certainly has been a lot of attention given to this whole field of trying to understand the relationship between the brain and religion. Uh, it's picked up in a lot of the scientific uh, uh, publications, the, the lay audiences, uh, religious groups and so forth, theology, philosophy. Pretty much all the different domains of academia have at least chimed in to some degree on what this is all about. And therefore, uh, I think that, um, no pun intended, it has hit a nerve. And, uh, and that being said, it, it's something that we need to take seriously and perhaps try to understand a little bit more what neurotheology really is about. And as, as expected, I think that there certainly have been uh, those people who have thought very positively about this, that, oh, this is a great idea and we should do more and more of this. There are certainly people who have been uh, somewhat um, uh, concerned about what this field was all about, worried about what it was going to do, or just think that it's not worth doing. And uh, so there are kind of both the positive and negative sides of things. And uh, I think that uh, if neurotheology is going to be useful at all and to sort of address some of the criticisms of it, that we need to have a very clear set of principles that we can utilize to help us figure out what we do with this field of neurotheology, how we can use it, what we would use it for, and, uh, and what it might ultimately contribute both to the scientific disciplines as well as to the religious and spiritual ones. And as I started to think about this a little bit more and started to write down some of the principles that, um, that I thought we should have as, as part of neurotheology, I realized that they cut across several different uh, aspects or domains, if you will. <clears throat> For example, I think there are methodological principles that need to be addressed. How do we actually utilize neurotheology? What are the methods that we might use? And some of this may turn to the neuroscientific approaches that we use. Some of it may turn to various psychological measures religious or spiritual measures, uh, all of these things are part of the methodology of neurotheology. I think it's also important that we take into consideration very strongly, if I, I envision this as a true multidisciplinary field, so we need to pay a great deal of attention and have a lot of respect and a lot of uh, interest in understanding and supporting both the neuro or the scientific side of neurotheology as well as the religious or theological side. Uh, and therefore, to some degree, I would hope that the principles that uh, at least I started to outline or whatever principles that we might ultimately come up with down the road would be something that would be accessible, agreed upon, appropriate for both the scientific as well as the theological or spiritual sides. Uh, so, of course, the question then is, is can we really set forth a, kind, a, a set of necessary principles for neurotheology which we can use for the foundation for a variety of future approaches for future scholarship and discourse. Uh, and, I, and I will say that as I went through, I actually wound up kind of numbering the different, uh, the different principles that I was able to come up with. Uh, and I, I sort of forced myself to say, well, I'm not going to count them until I get to the end, and I'll see how many I wound up with. And I actually wound up with 54, which I kind of liked because it's 3 times 18. So I kind of got the trinity in there, and I got 18 representing Chai. Uh, so at least I got the Judeo-Christian, I sort of missed Muslim, unfortunately, but, uh, but we'll work on that. So anyway, I'm sure there'll be more. Uh, anyway, now just taking a step back, let's just think a little bit about where neurotheology comes from. Because on one hand, uh, it's certainly easy to say, well, this is something that just developed in the last 10 or 20 years as we develop neuroscience and the, the ability to actually peer into the brain when people are engaged in various practices like meditation and prayer. But I think if we really kind of dig in a little deeper and look back in history, we find that virtually every tradition has had some interest in how the brain works. Uh, and of course, they didn't understand the brain per se or what the brain did, but, but maybe I'll extrapolate that or expand that to the mind. Uh, the, but the ways in which we think and feel and understand our world are an important part about how we understand our spiritual selves as well. If we look at Buddhist and Hindu texts, we certainly see a great deal of emphasis on aspects of consciousness, 
uh, the, sen the ego sense of self, aspects of suffering, how we as human beings are supposed to behave. And of course, I think to a large extent, this is true in Western traditions as well. Now, perhaps in the Western traditions, um, uh, the emphasis is more on specific types of thoughts and behaviors that we have. But nonetheless, there's certainly a great deal of interest in this. And, and just as an example, uh, if we go to the Bible, for example, um, there, there are the rules and guidelines by which human beings should live their lives. And if you look at the covenants or the various commandments, there is certainly an understanding of what human behavior is, uh, how it works when it works well, how it works when it doesn't work well, uh, how we should try to behave, a sense of morality. Uh, so there, there is a great deal of interest in all of these different ways in which we as human beings are supposed to think and behave. And of course, this spills over into our various emotions, emotions such as love, devotion, and, and also the negative emotions as well, do, <clears throat> about uh, not being jealous, not coveting, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, let me get a little more. Um, but all of these different aspects of the Bible are a part of what it means for us to be human beings. And in that regard, there is, as I said, this understanding of how we work. Uh, actually, um, you know, one of the, um, <clears throat> when we look at, uh, for example, Aquinas in his Summa Theologica, he very actively engages this in terms of thinking about the differentiation between our biological parts and kind of our, our mental parts when he talks about the actus hominis and the actus humanus. So here we have this very dualistic approach that we've got this kind of animal part and we've got this humane part, but how do they relate to each other? And of course, that's a very big part of philosophy. It's a very big part of various spiritual and theological traditions. Neurotheology, I think, now has an opportunity to come in and say, well, here is at least another part of that perspective. Now that we know a little bit more about how the body works, how the brain works, does that inform this discussion in any greater way? So I think ultimately, when we start to look at what cognitive neuroscience today has to offer, so the fields of psychology, neurology, health and medicine, uh, all of this put, coming together really provides a very different kind of perspective than what Aquinas had or what the ancients had in, in trying to think and figure out this relationship between what's going on in our head and how we are ultimately to be religiously or spiritually. Now, a couple of people, a couple of scholars who um, I think are also very relevant to the overall development of neurotheology uh, is this list here because what, we, what we're starting to see as we got closer to the present time was a little bit of an emphasis away from specific doctrine that goes on in the context of religion and spirituality, but more specifically various types of experiences that people have. So Schleiermacher, for example, started to emphasize that religion was not just doctrinal, but it was a feeling. There was something cognitive going on, something that we felt deep inside. He referred to this as a feeling of absolute dependence. When we start to talk about a feeling, well, that's something that we can talk about in the context of the human brain. Uh, William James and his, uh, his outstanding work, The Varieties of Religious Experience, really considered all different kinds that are all different forms that religious ideas and experiences can take within human experience. And he talks about those that are associated with pathology, those that are quote unquote normal, and we can talk about that later. But he addresses that there is a variety of different kinds of experiences. And when we talk about experience, now we have an opportunity again to bring this back to how does the brain help us to experience things? How does our brain use its senses, its thoughts, its feelings to help us interpret our reality and the world around us? Uh, Rudolf Otto, in the idea of the holy, talked about uh, the essence of religious awareness as a feeling of awe and basically a mixture of fear and fascination. So again, when we talk about fear and you look at the fields of cognitive neuroscience, well, there's a lot of research studies that have been done scanning the brain when people are given certain fearful conditions. So if we can understand what's going on in the brain with fear, can we start to connect that back to this type of a description? Now again, I, I don't know how much a, a direct connection we can make with all of these, but this is starting to lead us down this path towards a field of neurotheology. And in fact, uh, this is a, a one I'm going to sort of sprinkle throughout some of the research that we've been doing uh, over the last uh, 20 years or so, doing brain scans of people in various states and various practices. 
So this was a scan of one of our early studies that was done with a group of Franciscan nuns who did a kind of prayer called centering prayer. And uh, we were actually talking a little bit about uh, this kind of finding at uh, dinner where we were talking about the experience of that sense of unity that is frequently a part of profound spiritual experiences. Well, uh, this is a kind of scan called a SPECT scan, which allows us to look at blood flow in the brain. And what's kind of nice about how the brain works is that the more active a particular part of the brain is, the more blood flow it gets. The analogy I always think of is that, you know, when you want to drive your car faster, you step on the gas, you get, more, you get more gasoline. So the brain steps on the gas, you get more blood flow to that area, and therefore it can be more active. And the less active an area is, the less blood flow it gets. So when we look at these two scans, if you look over here on your left, this is the nun's brain at rest when they were not doing any particular thing. They weren't thinking or, or praying or anything like that. And this is the scan when they were uh, in deep, uh, deep state of centering prayer after about 45 minutes of their prayer practice. So I want to direct your attention to the lower part of the scan in here and in here. This represents the back of the brain. So it's basically they're lying down and the top of the scan here, this is the front part of the brain. Here are your sides of the brain and then here's the back of the brain. So in the back of the brain, there is a lot less activity here as demarcated by mostly yellows, not very much red. The red areas are the most active and then the yellow and the blue and the black. Uh, so these areas are much less active than the redness that you see over here when the person was just at rest. So this implies that there is a decrease of blood flow, a decrease of activity in this area of the brain. Now this area of the brain is called the parietal lobe. And its primary function for us, or one of its primary functions, is to take all of our sensory information and to create for us a sense of ourself and to establish where our self is in relation to the world. So it's this part of the brain that activates when we try to distinguish between ourself and other, ourself and the world. So if during a prayer practice, there is a substantial decrease of activity, what do we make of this? Well, if this is the area that normally is trying to help us establish our sense of self and establish that boundary between ourself and the rest of the world, a decrease of activity in that area may be associated with a loss of the sense of self. And of course, this is exactly what these individuals and a lot of people describe when they have a spiritual experience. They lose that sense of self. They lose this distinction between self and world, between self and God, self and universe. So that we think that there is a correlate here, a neurophysiological correlate that is associated between what's going on in the brain when the person has this experience of losing their sense of self, the sense of oneness, and when they are just in their kind of everyday mental state, when we do tend to have our clear sense of self. We could begin to use this kind of information to try to tease out a little bit more about, well, what's going on when we have that experience? And how does one kind of experience relate to other kinds of experiences, especially when we're talking about a person's sense of self? Now, some of the more recent developments of neurotheology began with uh, my late colleague, Jean DeQuilly, who uh, wrote several books, one of them called Biogenetic Structuralism, where he looked at many of these issues from an anthropological perspective, the, the evolutionary development of the brain and the first expression of different religious types of ideas through uh, when we talk about, for example, Neanderthal burials and so forth, various rituals that we are engaged with and how those rituals affect the brain. Uh, James Ashbrook was the, um, actually the first person that I'm aware of who ever published a research article using the term neurotheology. This was back in 1984, so I suppose to some degree he should be uh, attributed the actual term neurotheology. However, um, as I was told at one point, and I have confirmed this, uh, the first mention that I can find is in a book by Aldous Huxley called The Island that was published back in 1961, where um, he doesn't really talk about what it is, but it's sort of this futuristic society, and he just says they have all these strange you know, things that they did, strange um, academic domains, and he starts listing them, and in that list is neurotheology. So, um, so he had the first inkling of it. But um, uh, James Austin published a book called Zen in the Brain, talking a lot about meditation and brain-related practices. And of course, in the last 20 years, we really have had the development of a variety of different brain imaging techniques, uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, uh, the kind of imaging that I just showed you called SPECT imaging, uh, and PET imaging. So there's a variety of different ways that we can start to get at 
how the brain is working during these different practices, during these different states and experiences, so we can use this information to, to go forward. And uh, I was actually just at a conference in New York at the New York Academy of Sciences uh, back about a month ago, and I was just thrilled because um, when I first published our data on the nuns and on our meditators, there was literally maybe two or three other articles that were out and now with imaging and, uh, and these kinds of practices. And today, there's probably at least about 40 or 50 articles. And it was just wonderful to be at this conference where there's all these young uh, investigators who are now interested in the relationship between meditation and different types of practices in the brain. So it's really a, a very much a growing field. Uh, of course, I don't know how much of them specifically engage theological ideas, uh, at least as much as I would like to. But, um, but certainly, we're starting to see a growth in this overall process. And that, to me, is certainly very exciting. Okay, so, so on to the actual principles. Um, we're not going to go through all 54 of them tonight, but um, that would take us several hours probably. But I'm going to try to hit at least a few that I think are maybe the most important and, uh, and some of the ones that at least show a little bit of the breadth of, of where we go with this. And I think the first thing for us to talk about is the definition, the definition of all the different terms that we would potentially use in the context of neurotheology, but certainly starting with neurotheology. Uh, of course, one of the things that often, uh, as I've gone through this field and talked to lots of people from lots of different perspectives, uh, so often I find that we're not very good with our definitions. And I might be saying something like, well, a person has a spiritual experience. And one person understands a spiritual experience as being a sense of awe, like Rudolf Otto. Somebody else says it's a sense of oneness. Somebody else says that it's a religious experience. And then we can get into the debate of, well, where, what's the difference between spirituality and religiousness? Uh, so all of these things, uh, all of these ideas, I think to some degree require us to try to do our best to define them at the very least so that when we're talking, we can be clear about what we're trying to say and somebody can argue back with us. Uh, again, that to me, you know, one of the the great problems of the whole sort of religious versus atheist debate is that half the time, no one's even talking about the same thing. They're, they're, everybody's talking about God, but everybody's got a very different view on what God actually is. And I think that we really, I, I hope that this is an area where neurotheology may actually help to contribute a little bit to what these definitions should be. In fact, one of the things, one of the ways of doing this is to go around and ask people, what do you think? What is your definition? If I went around and asked each one of you what your definitions of spirituality, religion, and God were, I'd probably, you know, I don't know how many people here, maybe 50 people, I'd probably get pretty close to 50 different answers for every one of them. And I'm sure there'd be some overlap here and there, but it's amazing. In fact, one of the, um, the exercises I do with my classes is I put spirituality and religiousness up on the board and I say, okay, let's go, tell me what they are. And I have never gotten to the same conclusions with any group of people yet. So, um, I, you know, I think this is where the ability to try to define terms becomes very, very important and very, uh, and very much a principle of what neurotheology should be about. And of course, as a multidisciplinary field, part of what we need to think about is not only what the definitions are, but where, where do they even come from? So if we're going to talk about religiousness, should we take a theological definition of religiousness? Should we take a psychological one, uh, a, a medical one? You know, what's the right way to come up with these different types of definitions? And I think that to some degree, the research will help to propel us forward in trying to better understand just the nature of these definitions in and of themselves. So let me define neurotheology just again so that we're all clear as to where at least I'm coming from and, and then we can debate this later on uh, after I'm done. Uh, neurotheology to me refers to the field of study that links neuroscience with religion and theology. And a couple of points that I think are important about that definition. I do not think that it should be regarded as a neuroscientific study of theology or of religion. It's not a one-way street. Similarly, we should not always expect the sciences to be completely at the mercy of religious and spiritual ideas. It is not a theological study of science or neuroscience. And to some degree, for neurotheology to be successful, we have to keep science as rigorous as possible, recognizing its limitations, and keep the religious aspect as religious as possible. And this is one of the things that always comes up. We talked about this a little bit at dinner again. Um, you know, if I bring a nun into our lab and ask her to pray, is that okay? You know, is, is that kind of, one, is it okay for her to even do? And two, if she's able to do it, is she able to do it as well as when she's in the, a non-laboratory kind of setting? And if she has an experience, is it the same kind of experience? So there's a lot of very interesting questions that come up. 
And the last piece I want to say about the definition of neurotheology is that for me, for this term to work at all, the neuro side and the theology side have to be defined very broadly. So neuro does not just refer to neuroscience or cognitive neuroscience, but includes neurology, different disorders, uh, psychology, anthropology, uh, all the different ways in which we can get at what the brain is doing. And similarly, I think theology is certainly far too limited of a concept in the context of neurotheology and should include rituals, spirituality, religious experiences, prayer, meditation, all the different kinds of ideas, experiences, and practices that people engage in that are part of their religious or spiritual selves. Now, another important aspect of neurotheology for me is, I guess, where, where it comes from for me personally is actually the last point here, which is that I think that we should always have a passion for inquiry. And I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of people over my career that at least I feel seem to have that, that they're open to new ideas, that they're always pushing that envelope, always asking that next question. And that to me is a very important part of what neurotheology is about. We should always think about things in a constructive way, in a way that is skeptical, but positively skeptical. We're not here to tear down ideas, I think, but we're here to try to find ways of bridging gaps, uh, trying to find ways of integrating ideas and concepts, coming to conclusions with a great deal of caution, and being aware of all of the different biases that we, we all hold, our psychological biases, our religious and spiritual ones, our scientific ones. Uh, and, you know, again, uh, I always love when people think that science is so objective, and I know that there are scientists in the room, and I, I love science, I am a scientist, but, uh, you know, if you've ever been in, 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 a, in a, uh, an audience with a lot of scientists, it gets pretty emotional pretty quickly. So uh, as, as much as it's all objective, it's not, and because uh, it, it's ultimately human beings that are doing science as well. So uh, again, to me, there's a great deal of need for being skeptical, but I think it's, it's crucial for us to be skeptical in a constructive way that helps us to better understand ourselves and better understand these different ideas as opposed to trying to somehow knock down one particular person's perspective or another. Now, this is another thing that kind of came across my mind at one point. Um, people frequently refer to Occam's razor uh, when they talk about religion. And uh, in fact, I was just watching the movie Contact uh, the other night with my daughter, and that's actually one of the big pieces that comes up that she's trying to argue why God doesn't exist because of Occam's razor. And, uh, and I'm not going to bother botching the, uh, the Latin part because that was for Jean DeQuilly, but, um, but in English, um, Occam's razor really is plurality should not be posited without necessity. Um, <clears throat> the idea is, is, is a good one, the idea that we should limit unnecessary assumptions about things. And again, it, it has been used to argue against why do we need God to explain the weather outside and, and, and why things happen in the world. But I would argue that from a neurotheological perspective, there is a problem with this. And I would actually turn it around a little bit to what I, I refer to as, I was trying to be cute, uh, neurotheology's razor, um, that necessity should not be posited without plurality. Now, what I mean by this is, is that when we're talking about, let's say, a spiritual experience, maybe a mystical experience, if we come at it purely from the side of science, then it gets hard to find where that spiritual piece is. But that's assuming that you don't need the spiritual piece in the first place. So for me, if this is really going to work as a field and if we're going to be open to all these different ideas, we, we need to be able to say, you know, we don't know what the true answer is. We don't know what is necessary to explain a given phenomenon. And again, uh, at dinner we were talking about the near-death experience, so let's just take that as an example. Well, obviously one answer for what's going on in a near-death experience is the neuroscientific, that it's all happening in the brain. But the other one is that it's truly the soul moving on to the next, next realm, to heaven, wh whatever you believe. So we don't know what we need in order to fully explain what a near-death experience is. And if we say, well, we don't need that part, we don't need the soul part to explain it, how do we know that yet? And I think that that's one of the real strengths of what neurotheology can help us with is to say, what are all the different pluralities? What are all the different possibilities that could explain this phenomenon, scientific and otherwise, that can help us to better understand what that phenomenon is all about? And this is the example that I've been involved in recently. 
So one of the most recent publications that we did was a study of Brazilian mediums. And they claim to be able to get in touch with the spirits that are around. Uh, and in this particular case, we were doing, they did a practice called psychography, where they would just write down whatever the spirits told them. So we did scans of their brain while they were just writing regular. And then, we got, then they got into a trance state and we had them write again when they were just receiving the, the, whatever the spirits told them. Now we see a very clear difference in the brain. And what was particularly fascinating about this study was that um, of the group of people that we studied, about half of them were considered to be experts and the other half were considered to be relatively more novice. When we looked at the expert's brain, what we found was is that some of the areas such as the frontal lobe actually had substantial decreases of activity and that's, that's this line here, these lines here going down and that was in this area right in there, for example. Whereas the novices had very substantial increases between the control condition and when they were doing the psychography practice. So now there's some very interesting things here, some very interesting implications. It also goes back, I'll, I'll tie this back into the Occam's razor in a second. But one of the things that this tells us is that there's a difference between people who are experienced and those who are not. Now, my best analogy is, is that when you first learn how to play a musical instrument, what happens? Well, you've got to think about, you know, let's say the piano, for example. You have to think about every place you want your fingers to be. Now, you can still play music while you do this, but you're not playing like a concert pianist. When the concert pianist sits down at the piano and starts to play, that person doesn't worry about where their fingers are. The music just comes out of them. And to some degree, that's what is reflected here, that to some degree, they have to increase the activity in their frontal lobe, which is what we normally use to concentrate on something, uh, when they are trying to do the psychography, whereas the experts, when it just sort of happens for them, their frontal lobe activity starts to go down. It becomes more natural. It's some kind of flow experience for them. So it's kind of interesting that we can see this practice-related effect, a difference between experts and novices. But this also ties back to the larger question. So what's really going on here? Is this really showing that everything these people do is just a manifestation of their brain's function? Or am I actually picking up that their brain is somehow in, con in communication with the spiritual realm? And that there truly are these spirits that are flying around that I can't see in my scanner or I don't have a subjective perception of, and yet they do. Now, to some degree, the brain scan only shows what's going on in their brain when they have the experience. It doesn't tell you whether or not they truly are in contact with these spirits or not. And again, that to me is what ties us back to this Occam's razor idea that we have to be cautious about concluding that it's just a brain phenomena or it's just not a brain phenomena or it's clearly spiritual. Most likely all of these experiences have some sort of at least dual if not multiple aspects going on and we need to really explore them in as much detail as we possibly can before we make a statement as to what's truly going on in the context of these experiences. <clears throat> Now, another idea um, that to me seems very relevant here and, and perhaps edging a little bit more into the philosophical realm. Uh, when I was in college, I, I, I did enjoy taking a lot of philosophy courses and hermeneutics was always something that was kind of um, particularly interesting to me because to me, it seemed like it was very relevant to the human brain. When we talk about hermeneutics as a way of trying to interpret a text or an idea or a concept, um, we can apply that in the context of the human brain. How does the brain interpret this idea? What is the brain doing when we read the Bible, when we hear of somebody's spiritual experience, when we read a philosophical argument or a theological argument? How does our brain process that information? How, does, how, are, how are its senses used? How are our cognitions used, our emotions? And of course, again, when we, we can apply this to science as well, especially in the medical field that I'm a part of. Uh, you know, what's the right way to treat somebody with a certain condition? Well, you look at all the data and your brain interprets it. And some doctors say we should do surgery and some say we should use medicine. And then as data, more and more data comes on, it, it shifts and it's constantly moving around. So what we're really talking about here is the notion of trying to apply a concept of how our brain works and how our brain interprets the world around us to all the different ways in which we actually can understand our world, science, science, 
religion, theology, different spiritual practices, and ultimately try to create a more multidisciplinary or more integrated approach that brings together the elements of hermeneutics and philosophy, biblical exegesis, uh, and science in some kind of perhaps global hermeneutical system that we can start to understand how we as human beings interpret and understand our world. Now, as I mentioned, there are also several principles that are related to method methodology itself. Uh, so one of my principles was that theology and neurosciences must allow for new methods, concepts, and conclusions to arise from this, this field of work. What I mean by this is, is that, you know, it goes back to one of the things I, I mentioned a few minutes ago. Let's say we want to understand what spirituality actually is. Well, we can ask a group of theologians to try to interpret what theolo theology is, or excuse me, what spirituality is for us. But we might want to ask a group of psychologists. Maybe we want to poll people, as I said. Maybe we want to do brain scans of people who say that they've had a spiritual experience, or try to actually capture the brain when it's having a spiritual experience. And to some degree, we need to be open to all of those different methods for helping us to know or better understand what spirituality is, what God is, what religion is, uh, what all of these different ideas are about. So our current methods are necessarily limited. Certainly they are in science. I mean, we have this wonderful ability to do brain scans, but we're still just at the very beginning of trying to understand the, the incredible complexities of how the brain works. And ultimately, it becomes very important for us to blend together the subjective measurements that we can make. What do people feel? What do they experience? What do they think? And how that is combined with what we can look at from a scientific perspective and, again, perhaps from other perspectives as well if we want to truly embrace the multidisciplinary aspect of what neurotheology is about. And uh, so this was actually a study that I have not published yet. So this is um, uh, being submitted uh, shortly, I hope. Um, when I was in medical school, let me also make sure I know how I'm doing on time because I don't see any clocks. When I was in medical school, um, I was sitting through a pretty boring class of uh, learning about the visual system. And um, I, in a moment of lucidity, I woke up, I guess, to hear him make one, one comment that intrigued me. And uh, what he said was, was that there are certain neurons in our brain that fire when you are looking at a vertical line and certain neurons that fire when you're looking at a horizontal line. Well, I thought, well, that's very interesting because if I were to put them together, it looks a lot like a cross. I thought, well, I started to think about religious symbols. And I thought, well, are religious symbols important because of the meaning behind them? Certainly they are. But is it possible that there's something inherently powerful about a religious symbol that is different than other kinds of symbols? And I started to look into different types of religious symbols. And if you go online, you know, you can find all different kinds of examples of different religious symbols. And I was very intrigued by the fact that if you do go online and look up all different kinds of, you know, you look at Eastern, African, all these different kinds of traditions, you find a fair number of crosses, you find stars, and you find circles. I found no squares. Now, I like a squares. I mean, I don't know why a square wouldn't be a, a, a decent religious symbol, but for some reason, it never was. So why is that? And what we decided to do is to develop a research study where we showed people different symbols, some of which were religious, some of which were non-religious, and we also divided them into emotional symbols, some of which were positively religious, like, for example, a cross or a dove, and negatively religious symbols, like the, the picture of the devil or something, or a snake was actually one of the more popular ones. Um, one of the things that we found when we looked at the brain scans, I'm just going to focus up here, you see this little blob of activity. Now, this is between uh, religiously, religious symbols that were emotionally positive versus non-religious symbols that were positive. So the question is, is there something inherent about positive emotional symbols that have a religious context versus those that are non-religious? And this is the area that activated right in here. Well, this was really fascinating to me because this is our primary visual system. This is the primary visual cortex, our occipital lobe. Now, for those of you who are non-neuroscientists, you're thinking, all right, great, so who cares? But there's a reason why this is really important. This is where the basic raw information from your eyes comes, hits your brain. Now, why would that be different? Because theoretically, this, is, that, this area is pre-conscious. 
This is just where you're processing raw data. And yet, for some reason, the religious symbols activate this area more so than the non-religious symbols. And it kind of supported my original thought that maybe there is something inherent about these symbols that activates our brain more so than other kinds of symbols. And that may explain to some degree as to why we have co-opted some of the symbols, because not only do they have this theological meaning to, our, to us, but there is something actually inherent within them that makes them more powerful. So again, I sort of throw this up as an example of how we could start to use new and creative ideas, new methodologies to try to understand some relatively interesting and maybe even important aspect about w some aspect of religiosity or spirituality or about the brain itself. And there are other possible explanations for this which I won't get into because of time, but there are a lot of different ways that we could start to interpret this particular piece of information, some of which have implications for religion and spirituality, and some of which have implications for how the brain works. <clears throat> now, I, I've already sort of mentioned this, which is that I think it is very important for us to combine the subjective, the phenomenological characteristics of a given idea, a given practice, with what we can look at from a neuroscientific perspective. Because too often, uh, we wind up doing a scientific study measuring something that we don't really intend to measure. And uh, for example, I mean, if I'm going to scan a nun's brain in prayer, I really need to make sure I understand what she's feeling and thinking, or else what I don't even know how to interpret what the scan is. If she doesn't tell me it's a sense of oneness, it's a sense of love, it's a sense of you know whatever it is, then I don't know exactly what it is that I am scanning. So I think it's very important to better integrate the phenomenological aspects of our experiences with various scientific measures as well. And then ultimately that means that to some degree all of the methods that we can potentially think of, scientific and otherwise, should be considered to be potentially useful in terms of evaluating our religious and spiritual experiences. Now, in terms of neuroscience, um, I think that neurotheology certainly can be applied to a wide range of cognitive processes as well as health-related issues. So we've already seen one of them. That's the visual stimulation study that I did before. But we have the ability to try to understand the whole mind-brain connection. You know, some people have said, well, look, if we're going to try to understand human consciousness, why not study the people who can control their consciousness better than anybody? Let's get these monks in here you know, who can meditate for eight hours a day, who can control their body's, you know, postures and, and temperatures and heart rate and all that stuff. Let's study them. So this is a great way to understand the human brain. And perhaps we can learn more about human consciousness, how consciousness is related to the brain or not related to the brain. Um, and ultimately, I think this has implications from a psychological perspective, how we begin to think about... Um, with the relationship between spirituality and mental health. There's certainly a lot of studies out there that show that be people who are more religious or spiritual have less anxiety, less depression. If that's so, how does that happen? Uh, you know, what's going on? What makes someone turn to religion? You know, I, so often in, as a doctor, uh, I've seen two different kinds of people who are faced with some you know, tragic problem, a spouse that's just died. And some people embrace God and say, I'm turning to God to help me cope with my problem. And other people turn God away and say, I definitely, God d deserted me in my time of need. I need my spouse and I hate God now. So what happened? What's the difference between those two people? Is it something built in long ago? Is it something that had to do with the experience? You know, these are some wonderful questions for neurotheology to help us answer. And along those lines, uh, what are the negative aspects that religiousness and spirituality bring to people? Uh, I, I'm always intrigued by knowing individuals who are enormously religious and also enormously, enormously loving and compassionate and open and, and embracing of all people. And then, of course, there are those people who are enormously religious and they're willing to strap a bomb around their chest and kill somebody because they don't agree with themselves. What's the difference? What's the difference from a doctrinal perspective, a theological perspective, an experiential perspective, a practice perspective, and a brain perspective. And this, again, is where I think neurotheology, this field, nothing has been done in this area, pretty much. Uh, and, uh, and, and in fact, the only thing that I know of at all, I, I was contacted at one point by somebody who told me that she had interviewed some people who were these suicide bombers who had been caught before they did their thing and, um, and felt that ritual was a critical, a critical part of them becoming the way they were.
and we can start to study the effects of rituals on the brain and how that affects a person and how it changes their emotional state and how it affects the ways that, in which they think. I've already touched on this a little bit, the idea that we can actually try to explore through neuro neurotheology both traditional and non-traditional aspects of consciousness. So for example, we can think about consciousness in a brain perspective. We could try to understand when somebody experiences an altered state of consciousness, what's going on in the brain. But we can also try to explore whether or not there are various phenomenological or subjective aspects of consciousness that somehow seem to go beyond the brain. We already talked about near-death experiences. One of the common anomalous aspects of these experiences is the out-of-body part, where they feel that they are standing, you know, sitting up above themselves, looking down, and they see different things going on in the room around them, and they can relate that back to people. <clears throat> so that's very interesting. And we theoretically should take a real strong look at that and look at those phenomena and try to better understand whether or not consciousness literally can leave the brain or not. That would be obviously an incredible paradigm shift in terms of how we understand the brain and science. But again, this is where I think we're one area where I think neurotheology may help us to address a very unique question. And, uh, and perhaps to, some, to that de uh, degree, I think you know, the larger philosophical question about what's primary in the universe? Is it, our, is it consciousness? Is it the, kind of like the Buddhist concept that you know, the consciousness is everywhere and our brains just kind of tap into it? Or is the material world the real primary stuff of the universe that somehow elaborates consciousness in some form or another? There are people arguing about this on all different sides of the table. I think neurotheology allows us to bring together the two perspectives and tell us something perhaps a little bit more thorough, a little bit more integrated than what we have had before. So this is another scan that um, tells us something about how we do start to think about our consciousness and our perceptions of the world. This was a, a study that we did of people who were non-meditators and we asked them to do meditation practice for about eight weeks. We actually asked them to do it for, uh, a, it was a very brief kind of practice uh, called Kirtan Kriya, which is a mantra-based practice. And we had them do the practice, um, it was 12 minutes a day. We did it for eight weeks. We got these scans for them. Uh, these different time points represent, this first scan here is them just walking into our lab, basically. I mean, they came in, we consented them, we said, you wanna participate in the study? Great, okay, we're scanning your brain. Then we taught them how to do the meditation practice and we scanned their brain during the first meditation practice, the first time they ever did the meditation practice. Eight weeks later, they walk into our lab and without a whole lot of fanfare, we scan their brain again. And then we scan them the final time uh, in their final meditation practice. So I want you to focus on A and C here because this to me is the real important take home message of this study. Look at where this arrow is. This is pointing at a very central structure called the thalamus. The thalamus is one of the key relays in the brain. It takes in all of our sensory information, our visual and auditory uh, uh, information. And in many ways, people think this is the seat of consciousness. I'm not, you know, we can debate that, but this is one of the arguments that people have made. Well, their brain initially had what we would refer to as some asymmetry in their thalamus. This area is a little bit more active than this area. But look at what happens when they come in. These are just resting scans. They're not doing anything. Their thalamus is much more symmetric. In fact, if anything, the other side may even be a little brighter. It's like a little deeper red than the other side. And you can see that during the meditation practice, this other side becomes much more active. What this implies to me is that over eight weeks, just eight weeks, 12 minutes a day, they were able to change the way their brain worked by doing this practice. They were able to change a part of their brain that is very related to their awareness of, the, of reality around them and to their consciousness. So now extrapolate that to the nuns who, when I asked them how long they had been doing the practice, said 57 years. How did that change their brain, doing it every day, hours a day, for decades? So this has very powerful implications, not only for how we understand the brain and how it can adapt and change, but how it relates to our perceptions of reality and how those perceptions of reality can change. In terms of theology itself, so that was sort of the science piece of neurotheology. In terms of the science, uh, in terms of the theology piece, just like with science, I think to some degree anything's game here. Uh, any question that we have about theology that we can conceive of, uh, 
we can at least think about how neurotheology may help us in this, in this regard. It may not answer big questions, maybe it won't answer any questions, but it will at least give us a new perspective. Questions about how we think about God. Do we think God exists or doesn't exist? Again, it, it may not prove for us that God exists or not, but wouldn't it be interesting to know the difference in the brain of somebody who is, who does believe in God versus somebody who doesn't believe in God? When we talk about free will, that's a very central feature of religious traditions. Wouldn't it be interesting to know where free will may occur in the brain? Does free will occur in the brain? Very interesting studies that showed that there was increased activity in, in certain areas of the brain milliseconds before a person consciously makes a choice. So is that free will? Is it sort of pre-free will? The, actual, the, uh, the authors of that particular article suggested that we don't have free will, but we have free won't. That things start to well up in our brain that we can decide to enact, act upon or not. So a lot of very interesting questions. We're not, you know, I'm not, certainly not going to get to the answers here today, but, but we have the ability to think about all these different ideas that come out of religious and spiritual traditions and how they relate to our brain, how we can start to think about them and understand them and incorporate them into our own belief system. Uh, as someone who was always interested uh, in science and, and also particularly physics, I realized that neurotheology has its own kind of uncertainty principle. Maybe you know, you're, you're familiar with the Heisenberg uncertainty principle in, in, uh, in quantum mechanics or in physics. Uh, and I don't mean to necessarily suggest that the reason that this exists in neurotheology is because of physics. But to me, there is this fundamental uncertainty that exists within the neurotheological realm, and, and really particularly the brain realm. Um, every brain scan that's ever been done has shown changes that go on in the brain when we do anything. To me, what that implies is that everything that we do changes our brain. Every perception we have of the world, it's being processed by our brain. So we are, for all intents and purposes, trapped inside of our brain. We never can get outside of our brain and say, okay, this is what I'm thinking in here. This is what's really out there. I'm right. Okay? We never can do that. So that, to me, means that we always have some fundamental uncertainty about all of our beliefs. You know, it goes back to like, you know, movies like The Matrix. I mean, we never really know if the reality that we see out there is the way our brain interprets it. And actually, what a lot of literature shows us is that our brain makes tons of mistakes. We make all kinds of mistakes in how we perceive things and think about things. And the worst part about our brain is that it never bothers to tell you when it makes a mistake. So we just go blissfully through our lives thinking that we understand everything that's going on around us when the reality, unfortunately, is at least from the research, is far from the truth. So neurotheology, though, says, well, look, you know, we may have this uncertainty problem, but we have the uncertainty from our subjective part of our experience because that subjective piece is trapped within our brain to some degree. And if we use science, we always can kind of look at it objectively, but we, part of what we need to do with the brain imaging, for example, is still ask the person what they thought. Because otherwise, I don't even know what to do with the, what the scan means. So by integrating what we can think about phenomenologically with what we can understand from a scientific perspective, maybe we can do a little bit better at breaking through this uncertainty and getting to what reality actually is all about, or at least better understanding how we understand that reality. And this leads to uh, the topic that Jean DeQuilly and I often ended a lot of our papers and books with, which is neuroepistemology, that ultimately, whatever epistemological claims come about through this kind of research, I think ultimately have to be accept, accessible, acceptable, appropriate, whatever word you want to use, to both theological as well as scientific analysis. We have to be very careful about concluding that we have proven that mediums are in contact with the, the spirit world or that they're not in contact with the spirit world and it's just psychosis. We have to be very careful whatever conclusions we come up with knowing that they need to be consistent with what we understand phenomenologically, spiritually, and scientifically, so that we can get the, be the closest that we can to truly understanding the nature of the world around us. So I hope that in this introduction, if you will, to neurotheology, that I have at least defended it to some degree as an important field of scholarship and an important field of future scholarship. Um, I hope that all of this information is, or I hope what neurotheology, the information that neurotheology can provide is important 
to the sciences, but also important to religion and theology. Hopefully, both will benefit from this endeavor. And therefore, to me, the principles, as hopefully at least I've started with, uh, will really help to launch neurotheology and neurotheological scholarship. Uh, and hopefully, uh, maybe some of you out there and people uh, in the rest of the world who are interested in these topics can take these principles uh, at least as a starting point and hopefully do some great things. I, I only have you know, so many things that I can think about. I have my own limitations in terms of my own biases, but it'd be great to really open up this kind of dialogue to truly understand ourselves uh, in a better way, perhaps even, if I may be idealistic, towards a new enlightenment. Um, and, uh, and I will conclude, though, of course, th with um, one of the most important creations of all, especially within the human brain, which is humor, which is uh, to say that um, if you don't, I, I, one of my, uh, I think one of the people who had the greatest theological impact on me was Groucho Marx, and he said that these are my principles, and if you don't like them, I have others. <laughs> so if you do have interest, um, my book is Principles of Neurotheology. You can get it on Amazon. It uh, goes into all these things in a lot more detail. I'd love to uh, get feedback from people who are in the various fields. Um, to me, the more dialogue, the better. The more I can learn, the better. And, uh, and hopefully, the more all, all of us can learn, uh, the better we all are. So thank you very much. I'll answer for, uh, some questions. So thank you very much, Andy. Um, for a very enlightening uh, talk. I think uh, we've, we've learned a lot about neurotheology this evening. Thank you. And um, let's open the, the floor for questions. Uh, Joe? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, there, I'll repeat it since we missed the microphone there. But the question was about uh, what uh, what near death experiences are like and how people describe them, um, the and, and the proportion. Um, I, I don't know the exact numbers on the proportion, so I, I don't know if I can answer that. But uh, certainly, uh, the investigators who have looked at near death experiences often talk about a core set of experiences, which do uh, there are about ten or eleven features of the core experience, which do tend to happen in a large percentage, uh, maybe, you know, again, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm going to say maybe about 70%, 80%. Uh, and that includes things like an experience of traveling through a tunnel, uh, hearing a noise, uh, seeing uh, different sort of spirits or other beings there, oftentimes deceased relatives, and then ultimately entering into uh, what they refer to as the realm of light, this unbelievably beautiful, beautiful music, beautiful imagery, uh, and, and the most intense light that they have ever experienced. Um, and then actually some of the other pieces of it, which are then sort of the return part, is that they come to some knowledge that they have to go back, uh, and whether they hear that they have to go back or they come to the idea that they have to go back, um, and, then, and then kind of this rushing back into their, you know, into their body, into their life. So um, that does happen in a large percentage of people. Now, we were talking about this at dinner. Um, Part of the problem is, is that you don't know the exact numbers because you get what people describe to you. Um, one of the things that has been demonstrated over time is that a lot of people have very negative experiences. Uh, so uh, people can have like really hellacious kinds of experiences, bodies being ripped apart and that kind of, you know, immense pain. Uh, so people do describe that. They seem to have been more commonly described in earlier periods of time, particularly like medieval uh, descriptions of near-death experiences. Um, so we, you know, we're, we don't know for sure, um, but, um, but there certainly seem to be, a, you know, that basic kind of description of these experiences. And, uh, but what, uh, you know, some of my colleagues who study near-death experiences in particular will tell you is that there doesn't seem to be any explanation that explains all of them uh, or explains all aspects of it. And of course I did, I actually, the other piece of this is that anomalous experience where people describe out-of-body experiences. Uh, you know, knowing something that they shouldn't have known otherwise. Sometimes they'll, they'll meet a deceased relative, but they didn't know that they were dead kind of thing, and they had just died like last week or whatever. Um, so, you know, you can get some real weird stuff too. But, um, but uh, there's enough similarity that they, you know, it's not like completely diversified. Um, and, but people are still trying to understand it and trying to understand, like one of the things that is interesting, uh, when people have studied near-death experiences in India versus here in the United States, well, I mean, people who are in India who are Hindu, they don't, they don't tend to see Jesus Christ. Uh, 
in their experiences, whereas people who are Christian are more likely to see that. But, but then the question that becomes is, are they simply seeing a being that then if you're Christian, you attribute it to Jesus Christ, and if you're Hindu, then you attribute it to you know, Krishna or whatever. Um, so you know, these are huge questions that we don't know the answers to. Yeah. Yes. Um, it is my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but the um, bold um, contrast system, fMRI, mm -hmm. has limited uh, resolution yes. to such a degree that a person looking at a house excites a certain blood flow distribution. Not different from the same person imagining it. That's absolutely right. Yeah. Now, with that kind of limited resolution, yeah. one could surely not tell the difference between one meditation and another. Mm. Am I right in concluding well, that? I mean, part of the issue is, 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 as you mentioned, these are limitations that we have today. Um, you know, whether or not we can do... Uh, when, when, when I show you, like, a part of the brain, that frontal lobe that's activated, you're seeing a little area. Uh, there are millions of neurons in there, and we don't know which ones are activated exactly. and which ones are not. So we should hopefully be able to get better at being able to determine the difference between a variety of different kinds of experiences, a variety of different kinds of practices. But, but you're absolutely right. I mean, we ultimately, uh, it becomes very difficult for us to know whether the brain is responding to something that's out there or we are envisioning that thing out there. And, and that's certainly an argument that I use all the time in that epistemological discussion. So, Thank absolutely. you very much. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Dr. Newberg, I have a uh, hypothetical question that may help me interpret the research findings of neurotheology. Okay. And the hypothetical is this. What if you brought in people, and in your research, they were asked to meditate, and one group meditated on uh, God's love, other group meditated on uh, the harmony of the universe, and the research showed, again, it's a hypothetical, the research showed that their brain scans were different from baseline, but they were different from each other, mm -hmm. and that uh, appealed, that, that occurred in all cultures. How would neurotheology interpret that result, that, that neuronal firing was different from imagining God's love versus imagining the harmony of the universe? Well, How would I, you interpret that? I mean, that was your research finding. I know yeah, it's no, I, well, the future, actually, probably. It's, it's probably not that dissimilar from some of the things that we have found. Um, I mean, the short answer is I'm not totally sure how to answer the question. Um, you know, to me, that's part of the fascinating aspect of this. Uh, you know, you could start, I, I think one would start to think about what that does mean. So one, one of the things, of course, as the last gentleman talked about, is are, are we simply seeing these differences uh, that are related to different limitations of what the science can show? But assuming that they are a real finding, just for a moment, um, the question then becomes is, uh, one, does it help us to understand that they really are different experiences, or are they the same experiences? And we had, uh, again, uh, uh, we had a lot of good conversation at dinner. Um, you know, when um, people, uh, like I was just saying, with the near-death experience, if, if a person sees a being and they interpret it in one way or another, is it fundamentally the same experience or are they fundamentally two different experiences? So part of how I might begin to interpret that result is that at least from a neurological perspective, a neurophysiological perspective, these people are having two different kinds of experiences. Now, you know, then it gets more into, well, is one of them maybe better or worse for them? Is one of them more close to reality or not? Those are larger epistemological questions, which I probably couldn't get to. But I think my, my first interpretation would be that there is, at least neurophysiologically, something that is fundamentally different about the person who says, I experience God's love versus I experience the harmony of the universe. Um, that may, you know, but I'm, I'd be open to lots of argument and discussion after that. I mean, I, that would be how I would start but um, I think there would be a lot of very profound implications for when those different experiences come about, how they come about, whether they're related to the tradition or not. Um, so there, there's a lot of really interesting things that I think you could ultimately come to. How far you can go, I'm not sure, but that's for neurotheology, I guess, to figure out. Uh, okay. Recently there was a book, uh, Proof of Heaven, where he <laughs> argues that 
his experience was somewhat unique and right. was outside the brain from his neurological perspective. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering how valid you thought his analysis of his interpretation of being outside the brain experience. Yeah. And then the other piece, he talks about the Monroe, Monroe Institute and the sound tapes that one can get to alter consciousness. And do you know if anybody's using them? Um, so, well, I, two, two very interesting questions. Um, I, to be, I mean, I, I have no doubt that that, uh, that, that doctor um, really had that experience. It was certainly uh, very fascinatingly described and very well described as an experience. Um, the thing that I was disappointed in was the conclusion that I felt was sort of leapt to that his brain was actually dead. Um, I, at least based on what I heard, I did not see any true evidence that his brain was actually dead. Um, I did not see any report of any EG study uh, to show that there was no electrical activity, there were no spec scans or fMRI scans. Uh, to me, it seemed like, the, if, if, again, if I read it right, uh, it seemed like the conclusion was something along the lines of, well, I had a really, really bad brain infection, my brain was dead. But that doesn't necessarily, at least from my view, as somebody who has done brain death scans on people to prove that they are actually dead, you don't do that unless, I mean, you, you don't declare somebody brain dead unless you show that there's no activity there. So, um, but now that being said, um, and, and a little bit apropos of the question about near-death experiences, uh, the early work on near-death experiences was actually done in people who were not physically near death. Uh, they were actually in life-threatening situations like avalanches, for example. So uh, I certainly believe that he had the experience. I certainly believe that it was an extraordinarily transformative and powerful experience. Uh, I, I, I don't, at least I haven't seen the data that supports that his brain was truly dead. Uh, but, um, but it certainly presents all kinds of interesting implications either way, you know, in terms of, uh, and actually, I mean, and to be honest, I mean, I've, seen, I've read about so many other near-death experiences which seem to have a lot of very similar characteristics. I mean, this one was particularly well described, I guess, and, and of course it was pr described by a neurosurgeon, so that had some influence, but, um, but there's been a lot of doctors who have described their near-death experiences, and, and they do often, and, and he actually had a lot of the same basic core elements. I mean, he kind of went back and forth for some reason, and that may have been because of the prolongation of his, of his disease, but, um, but other than that, you know, I, 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 I didn't find the argument that his brain was dead uh, compelling, at least in the book. And as far as the, if I think I understand what you're talking about, uh, there are people who are trying to study different ways in which the brain can be uh, sent into different states and so forth, and some of it with different lights and sounds and all that kind of thing. So people are working on that. I haven't seen if there's any brain scan studies yet uh, to look at that, but, but I know that people are trying to do that kind of work. Yeah, thank you. Um, a lot of uh, disciplines are looking at uh, the self as a concept and whether or not it's even real. Mm -hmm. The International Society for the Study of Psychology of the Self had, a, uh, had their annual meeting in Washington, D.C. Last, last year, and the whole theme of the conference was, is the self real? Yeah. Um, like, um, for, I relate that to the work of uh, Carl Friston at the Max Planck Institute, who's done a lot of work on looking at the brain as a hierarchical Bayesian coding machine, and that the self is just a, um, a hyper Bayesian prior, mm. and that possibly going beyond the self, such as in a meditative practice, may actually be a more a more efficient predictive coding model. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, that, uh, I, I am uh, you know, somewhat aware of, of that work, and, and I agree. I mean, t this has always been something that's been uh, prime in my own mind, at least even from a philosophical perspective, is, is to what extent does our self exist? Um, and, and I guess one of the things that I, I didn't say to just kind of pick up on what you were talking about is part of what my fascination of this whole field uh, over the years has been is this idea that, well, if we're going to get outside, how do we get outside of the brain? How do you get outside of yourself? And it is in these meditative, mystical kinds of experiences where uh, that's the only pl type of experience that I'm aware of where people do describe that. So I think we do have to take a very, very strong look at what those experiences are about, what does happen to this sense of self, uh, and what that sense of self actually means. So I, I agree. I mean, I it probably falls a little bit more into the domain of consciousness and, and psychology, as you mentioned, than perhaps neurotheology. But I think 
you know, certainly from a theological perspective, that sense of self and how the self relates to God and, and our universe is going to be an important piece. And I, I would think that studying the brain in the context of those individuals who do get outside of their self or experience the loss of self or something like that could be very important uh, in that regard. I'll, I'll have to look a little bit into what, uh, what was being said at that conference. Actually, it'd be interesting for me too. So I appreciate you pointing that out, but I'll, I'll take a look and see how that may be related to some of the stuff that we're doing. So thank you. Oh. Thank you very much for coming tonight. I really enjoyed your talk enormously. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, the part of your talk that interests me more um, than other parts is the part about neurotheological epistemology. Mm. So I'm That's going to put <laughs> two things together and ask you for a clarification or further thoughts. Um, one thing was the part where you talked about how possibly the process of research could itself drive the findings. Mm -hmm. And the other part is principle 36, which talks about uh, the possibility that uh, whether reality is primarily matter mm. or primarily consciousness yeah. could be solved by neurotheological right. inquiry. Yeah. I guess my, I mean, I'm not That's in, a bit of a pipe dream, but in yeah. medicine, yeah. <laughs> I'm not in medicine, so I can't quite conceptualize what an experiment like that could be like. I'm still but waiting for that one too. From <laughs> a, well, from a philosophy point of view, yeah. I would have thought it was the other way around, that our conceptions of whether reality is primarily material or primarily ideal mm. would precede an investigation and inform the concepts that we use to investigate. But maybe I don't see well, no, the I, direction of your inquiry. Thank no, you. I appreciate that. I, in fact, I, I completely agree with what you just said. Um, you know, to me, part of, uh, part of the, the, what I'm fascinated by, at least from a methodological perspective, is this ability to think about, well, how do we think about these ideas philosophically? How does that actually inform the methodology of the science? You know, if we're going to say, well, if we're going to use, do some kind of brain scan to try to prove reality or whatever that means, um, you know, what, 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 what do we, how do we get to that in the first place? How do we know what a proof constitutes? What, what do different philosophers have to say? What do different spiritual leaders have to say, spiritual thinkers? Um, so, and that also kind of ties back into your first question, which is that I think to some degree, as we develop these different approaches, the methods themselves will kind of evolve and develop over time so that, you know, right now I do a brain scan because I take a nun and I say, I'm going to scan your brain. And, I'm go and if she has the experience of being in God's presence, I say, well, this is interesting because I now know what goes on in her brain when she has the experience. Doesn't, you know, prove or disprove. But maybe the next time I think, all right, well, is there a way, you know, what does she think about the reality of that experience? How does she begin to think about that? Um, can I redesign a study that, I agree with you, I mean, I have no idea how this study would look, but can I redesign it in some way? Uh, when I have thought about it, I sometimes kind of come back to, is there some sort of self-reflect, like I look at my own brain scan while I'm looking at my own brain scan kind of thing. Um, and I don't know if that would do anything either, but um, something along those lines. But, uh, but I, I, I would, I mean, to me, part of what I would love to see is a little bit uh, deeper interaction with philosophy and theology to really get a better feel for developing studies that are better studies, uh, as opposed to just me as a neuroscientist coming and say, well, let me think about how I can do a scan or whatever. Um, but also uh, then kind of circling back and say, okay, well, I did this study. I got this result. Does that now tell me something about whether my initial viewpoints on whatever it is on epistemology in this case uh, were it, was there, is it valid? Is it not valid? Do I need to modify that as well? So I, I you know, to, to some degree, this is very sort of pie in the sky and very theoretical. I don't know whether there really will be a way of getting closer to those epistemological questions, but I guess part of why I feel, you know, this is, this is now I'll say this in defense of neurotheology, is that part of what I think is that if we just go down the philosophical side, if we just go down the spiritual side, we seem to hit certain limitations, especially as we try to understand the material world. If we just go down the scientific side, we learn a lot about the material world, but we don't get to, we also don't get to those fundamental questions. So to me, both sides seem to hit a limit. And I think, and I think, and I don't know, that maybe by bringing them together, there's a way to get, that they can kind of bootstrap themselves up and get around that. I don't know if that will happen. Love to see it happen. If I ever figure it out, you'll all be the first to know. But, um, but yeah, so that, that's kind of how I begin to think about how and why it might happen. But 
Uh, but we certainly, I certainly have a long way to go with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've thought about this for some time, about 65 years ago, <laughs> uh, telling my age. Uh, I had an, an emergency appendectomy in a small hospital in upstate Pennsylvania. And at that time, uh, ether was the primary anesthetic. And so I remember certain things that happened to me during the application of that anesthetic. Fast forward about 30 years later, and I'm reading Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's book, mm. and I'm saying, oh my God, <laughs> when, when I, those first four or five stages that are described, I experienced when I was having ether applied to me, yeah. but I wasn't dead, brain dead, nothing happened, I just experienced, and it, it's just a common thing that I've always wondered about. Has anyone ever looked at the effects of anesthesia on these out-of-body experiences, and how does that relate to brain scans? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and actually, uh, the answer is that yes, people have started to think about that. Um, uh, certain uh, anesthetics, um, uh, one of them called ketamine, is something that actually has been shown to uh, result in a lot of very similar kinds of experiences, and people have turned to that as a potential model uh, for near-death experiences. And when we do talk about the near-death experience, I mean, there, there are a lot of approaches that people have taken. Some people have thought about different neurotransmitters, the effects of different drugs. Um, it's, the, the data is, 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 I don't want to say it's confusing, but it's complex, uh, and it's not really clear, excuse me, exactly how all those different things interact with each other. In fact, uh, as we were talking about again at dinner, um, we, we were saying that, uh, that people who've actually tried to commit suicide through drug overdose often are less likely to have a near-death experience. So it may be that the drugs make you, or certain drugs at least, make you less likely to have it. Uh, and, and, but certainly, you, again, you don't have to be truly dead in order to have the near-death experience. I think learning about how those different drugs and those different neurotransmitters play a role is certainly a part of it. And of course, uh, going back to the kind of the epistemological question, you know, we still have to entertain the possibility that there is something where our consciousness goes beyond ourselves. In fact, um, I am working with this guy, uh, a doctor named Sam Parnia, who has designed a study to test the out-of-body experience. And he has the idea that, look, if you're in a, in a bed and you are floating above the bed, if we put a shelf above where the person would be and put some strange photograph up there, if somebody has a near-death experience and they have the out-of-body piece and they look down and they see this kind of, you know, picture of the Eiffel Tower or whatever, you know, it is, um, and they report that to you, you've really learned something about reality, about consciousness, about a lot of these issues. So there are ways of designing studies, not necessarily through brain scans, but through other different approaches that may all have some impact on, on what the nature of near-death experiences and, and uh, our, the nature of reality actually is. Do sure, do do more. Okay. Oh, perfect. One more. So okay. thank you very much. I really enjoyed your lecture. And um, I teach adjunct at Chestnut Hill College, Health Psychology, Mind, Body, Spirit Connection. So I use some of your research. Oh, thank you. And it makes a lot of sense, and it's nice to meet you. Thank you. But um, I've been meditating myself for 40 years, transcendental meditation with all the research behind that. And I'm sitting here wondering if you're a meditator. <laughs> And if you're not... <laughs> Why not? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> because it would answer so many questions, again, from my perception no. of everything that you're, you're talking about. I mean, I, as was brought out earlier, civilly do we disagree, but I feel very dogmatic in saying, wow, yeah, it's, there's yeah. consciousness, and it's an absolute experience, out-of-body experiences. So right. do you have you, but the real question is, is do I, are, are you a meditator? And would sure. you like to be? I could help you. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I certainly have dabbled in a variety of different practices. Um, you know, part of, um, part of how I came to this whole field was uh, I started out, uh, you know, when I was very young, just asking these kinds of epistemological questions. You know, what's the nature of reality? Why do people have different religions, different beliefs, and so forth? And um, as I went through my training, uh, when I went through college and, and medical school and all that, uh, I, I kept seeing science as a great approach, but as I mentioned a minute ago, but not the full approach. And I began to think about these questions from a very philosophical perspective, which ultimately turned into a kind of philosophical meditation, 
uh, contemplation, if you will, where I did spend many hours in, I, you know, for lack of a better word, contemplation, I guess, is, is the word that I sometimes feel is maybe more appropriate. Uh, so I don't, I, I would say that I, I do, haven't done a formal type of meditation practice in the sense that I, you know, I've done TM or something like that. But, um, but I've been and continue to be very engaged in this uh, very personal journey of, of discovery and trying to kind of understand uh, the nature of reality through my own uh, my own processes, but then bringing in what I can from what I understand from the different practices, the different traditions, uh, from the theological and philosophical side, and from the scientific side. And I guess that, so part of my realization, if that's the right word, has been that we need something that's very multidisciplinary and very integrated. And, and so, like I said, I, 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 and I guess what I, what I also wind up saying is, is that as part of this contemplative process, maybe maybe the best I can say about that has been that I, I certainly have a very deep appreciation for those individuals who have been involved in meditation practices and have had very powerful spiritual experiences, perhaps even mystical experiences. Um, uh, at least I feel like I have a good appreciation of what that's all about for people, even though I'm not sure I would where I would list my own experiences yet, but I'm Still working on it. Okay, so, thank you. Still young. Still young. I'm still young. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, let me just, yeah, thank you. Good. Okay. So thank you very much, Andy. I, you're, I find your uh, creativity and your openness delightful. No? And um, I think uh, Andy is really a model of what we're trying to do here with the constructive engagement of, you know, science, spirituality, religion, and technology. So um, thanks so much for being with us. And uh, thank you for coming. And do come again. April 8th is our next uh, event. And we're also having an open dome night, hopefully, on April 16th, if the weather cooperates. So come. Open dome. We, they, we open the planetary, or the observatory. Yeah, we have an observatory, small observatory, but it's fun. So safe home. I hope uh, the weather conditions are good.